Good morning, everyone. I'll give another minute before we get started. Hi, Chris. Nice to see you. Sorry, I couldn't be there in person today. No worries. Nice to see you anyways. Start at 12.01. Hi, Barry. I see you're there. I mean, I, I'm okay to wait another couple minutes. And okay. If that's, if that's yeah. all right with you. Don't yes, let people absolutely. accumulate. Yes. So I'll get started because it's 12.02 and I uh, want to welcome everyone to our medical grand rounds uh, uh, from uh, Providence Health uh, Care at St. Paul's Hospital. And um, I'm very honored uh, to welcome Dr. Uh, Yarnell and first like to uh, acknowledge that I'm calling in from the unceded traditional and, and ancestral territories of the Coast Salish peoples, the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh and the sorry, Squamish. Um, and uh, very grateful to work and live on these lands. And uh, we, as a department, are committed to the truth and reconciliation calls to action. And also, uh, we are working to respond to the in plain sight report in our care for people who are Indigenous to reduce anti Indigenous racism. And that is a commitment that I think the department members work to every day. Um, Chris uh, Yarnell is someone that I've known for many years, and it's a delight to see him come and present. He's uh, an, a critical care physician who is currently in the uh, Elliot Phillipson Clinician Scientist Training Program at the University of Toronto. Um, he's interested in improving the care of people who are critically ill with a focus on respiratory failure. Um, his research areas are in Bayesian methods, adaptive trials, and machine learning. Uh, he trained in Toronto in internal medicine and critical care, and he studied in uh, mathematics prior to joining uh, University of Toronto Medical School and was, I believe, at Princeton for that. Uh, he did his PhD at the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation in Toronto, and his other research interests include motor vehicle trauma, causal inference from observational data in critical care, and impact of social determinants of health on critical illness and end-of-life care. So without further ado, we welcome you and we look forward to hearing you speak today. Thank you, Chris. Thanks so much, Dr. Palabu. And, uh, and, and thanks so much to the uh, UBC uh, Division of Critical Care to, uh, to bring me here this week to meet with some people and, uh, and, and do a little bit of rounds. And uh, I'm having a great time, it's really lovely. Um, so my name is Chris Yarnell and I'm, in, and as Dr. Palabu said, I'm an intensivist from the University of Toronto and I also work in, the Scarborough Health, I work in the Scarborough Health Network and the University Health Network. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about oxygen therapy, something uh, it's you know, quite ubiquitous. We all use it. We don't always think too much about it. I'm not going to talk about uh, sort of glamorous, fancy things uh, like ECMO. I'm going to talk about things like nasal prongs. And we'll, we'll go over a little, bit of, a little bit about the history, a little bit about the devices, and highlight a couple of contemporary issues uh, with equity according to uh, patient race in the use of oxygen therapy. Uh, indeed, I have some financial support from the Department of Medicine as well as the CIHR. Um, I, uh, I, I also would like to acknowledge that we're on the shared unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples. And usually I'm living and working on uh, the, the territory of the Huron, Wendat, Seneca, and Mississaugas of the Credit. We have three objectives, more or less. The first one, we're going to go a little bit over the history, like I mentioned. 
uh, uh, we're going to weave into it some discussion of oxygen devices and why you might choose one over another. And then last of all, we'll highlight a couple of contemporary inequities. Uh, we're not going to address, like I said, some of the other, other ways that you might uh, think about um, in, uh, uh, improving somebody's low oxygen levels okay, and other aspects of oxygen therapy. So for a case, we have a 60-year-old uh, admitted to the hospital with pneumonia, uh, alert with a mediocre heart rate and blood pressure, uh, a concerning degree of tachypnea, saturation in the, you know, uh, a little bit lower than you'd expect, despite six liters of nasal prong oxygen, feeling short of breath. And the question is, how should we support this individual's hypoxemic respiratory failure? So you can keep that in mind as we go through all of this. We're going to begin by backing all, all the way up to uh, a, a, an equation that I'm sure many people have seen at many points in their education, where, you know, we have glucose here and oxygen gas, and then we have water and carbon dioxide. Of course, if you go this way and you add some sunlight and chlorophyll, that's photosynthesis. And if you go the other way, that's cellular respiration. And that's why oxygen is so important, you know, even for our patient with pneumonia that we just looked at and for all of our patients. However, it's not the case that uh, we've always had oxygen in the air at 21%. In fact, for most of uh, the Earth's history, uh, it's been much lower than that. I, I hear somebody. I wonder if they have a question or perhaps they're unknowingly unmuted. I mean, I'm always open to questions. But, uh, <laughs> uh, all right. So, so th this plot here shows you the percentage of present oxygen levels. It's logarithmic, so there's a tenfold increase between every tick on the graph. And then on the x-axis, you see time going into the past. And so the Earth starts 3.8 billion years ago. There's almost no oxygen for the first one, like oxygen gas in the atmosphere, the first, for the first one and a half billion years. And then photosynthesis starts, and there's like sort of between 1% and 10% of present-day levels of oxygen. And for, for the last half a billion years, it's about the same at 21%. There's a brief period where it actually is thought to have increased above 21% to be like more like 30%. And that's around the time when there were lots of many, there were many large animals like megafauna they're called. And it's thought that maybe that high concentration of oxygen was a contributing factor because it allowed for more metabolism, more of that cellular respiration to support gigantic organisms. Uh, oxygen as a gas was discovered at least three times first by a Polish philosopher who wasn't really sure what they'd gotten their hands on, and then about 100 years later, by, concurrently by Carl Wilhelm Scheele and Joseph Priestley. Scheele was the first discovery, although the second to publish. And the way he synthesized it was with, uh, uh, basically, with oxides. So he had manganese oxide and potassium perchlorate, and he was heating them up in these beakers and then capturing the gas in a bag connected to the beaker. Uh, unfortunately, he also used mercuric oxide for this purpose, and actually he died of mercury poisoning several years later. Um, after this initial description of oxygen, it, the sort of further investigations into it and sort of establishing its role in its, its essential um, role in human metabolism was done mostly by Lavoisier, but not just Antoine, the classic Lavoisier that, we, that, that is more well known, but also by his wife, Mary Ann Paul's Lavoisier. Uh, it turned out she provided a lot of editorial and illustrative and scientific uh, uh, partnership with him that, uh, you know, wasn't really recognized in its time, but we can recognize it briefly now, I suppose. Uh, a hundred years after that, there was the first case report of oxygen for pneumonia. And this was published by a physician named George Holtzapple, who uh, was, worked in upstate New York. And he, he, he got the idea to use oxygen for pneumonia. He actually, in his case report, he wrote that he thought the problem with, with the patient he was seeing was that the oxygen levels were low. And if he supplied some extra oxygen, he was going to help them feel better. And so he sort of captured the physiologic rationale for using oxygen in pneumonia, which to date had not been described like that. So his patient that he described as a 16-year-old man who had pneumonia, was quite sick, and actually he said that, the, he writes that the respiratory rate was 75 to 80 breaths a minute. 
which is really high. I'm not sure I've ever seen that in an adult, um, but I guess that's what he wrote. And, uh, and, and here's how he gave the patient oxygen. So he, he, he put potassium chlorate and manganese oxide in a test tube uh, or a beaker of some sort, then, then attached a hose to the top of it, which then he, he, he put the other end of the hose in a bucket of water. And as the, as the minerals were heated, they gave off oxygen gas and that bubbled out of the bucket and he used a fan to blow the oxygen gas at his patient. And he says he did this intermittently over the course of a day. And, uh, and each time he did it, the respiratory rate would improve to like 60 breaths per minute is what he wrote. And the patient survived. Me, I, I'm not sure if that's a testament to, you know, a res the resiliency of 16 year olds or the miracle of oxygen supplementation. But in any case, this was the first case report describing oxygen therapy for pneumonia. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll pause on the, the history for a moment and just a, a brief reminder. I'm sure there are some in the crowd that are very familiar with this and maybe others that are less so. Um, uh, and, you know, I've reproduced a figure here from the classic West respiratory physiology textbook. So on the, the y-axis, there's the pressure of oxygen. And on the x-axis, we go from the atmosphere into the mouth and the airways through the uh, the, the, the large airways, the small airways, to so the alveoli, into the capillaries, and then the arteries, to tissues, uh, and then cells and mitochondria, okay? So that's what happens along the x-axis. And you can see that in the air, the pressure of oxygen is the highest, and then there's a drop when you get to the alveolus, and that's because of carbon dioxide coming out of the capillaries and, you know, gas exchange, carbon dioxide coming out and oxygen going in. And there's another little drop between the alveoli and the capillaries, and that's diffusion. And if, if this, you know, in a perfect world, there's no drop there because the diffusion is perfect, but maybe there's a small drop for most people. And then again, a small drop when the capillaries all join together into arteries, because not all capillaries have perfect matching of ventilation and perfusion. And then that's sort of how things work when all is well. So how can it go wrong? Well, this diagram really helps, helps us understand. So first you can have a low inspired oxygen. And that can be for like exotic reasons, which you might encounter in British Columbia, not so much in Ontario, like altitude or other. But in my experience, the most common reason for a low inspired oxygen is that it's a relative low inspired oxygen and the, un the oxygen supply has been unintentionally disconnected. So if there are any medical students in the crowd, you can save the day by double checking to see if the oxygen is connected when oxygen levels are suddenly surprisingly low. Um, now, after that, of course, hypoventilation can cause hypoxemia. And we talked about how this drop is because of carbon dioxide. So when there's hypoventilation, you have even more carbon dioxide accumulating in the alveoli. It's not getting cleared out. And so then there's less, uh, you know, the oxygen is getting even more diluted. And so you can get hypoxemia from that as well. And now we're getting into more sort of, um, uh, yeah, we can, Getting into more chronic causes here, we have like if you have diffusion problems, so for example, fibrosis or maybe edema of the basal membrane, basically the space between the air and the capillary, if that's wider or thicker or there's something wrong, then that can cause problems with oxygen diffusing across. And these can be particularly exaggerated if the cardiac output is high because oxygen diffuses slowly. And so if the blood flowing past is going really quickly, then it will be incompletely oxygenated when it you know, finishes traversing the capillary. After that, the most common reason, and again, for medical students in the crowd, this is always the good first answer to causes of hypoxemia, VQ or ventilation perfusion mismatch. So, and that can be complete, like in the case of a shunt where you have blood going, say, from the right to the left side of the heart without touching in the air at all, or it can be incomplete just where the ventilation and the perfusion are not well matched. And so the blood gets incompletely oxygenated. And then once it all rejoins together, you get hypoxemia in the artery. Patients with hypoxemia usually have more than one cause. I've included a reference at the bottom of a cohort of 1,200 patients from critically ill patients, and half of them had hypoxemic respiratory failure, and, and more than half of those had more than one cause. The most common causes are <clears throat> pneumonia, atelectasis, and fluid overload. Okay, And uh, in most circumstances, basically everything except pure shunt, Increase, supplemental oxygen can improve the arterial oxygen content. So fortunately, um, since the days of George Holtzapfel, more efficient methods of storing and delivering oxygen have been developed. 
so this is the first innovation where they, uh, George Barth used a hand crank to pump the oxygen from this bag into a copper uh, tank. And then that allowed sort of oxygen to be transported to where patients were. And then uh, they, they pressurized it to 450 PSI and you could uh, access it. And they, they would use like tubes or nasal prongs or things like that. Uh, nowadays, however, that's not how we do it. Now we, we use something called fractional distillation. And this relies on the different boiling points of the main components in air. So oxygen, nitrogen, and then to a lesser extent, argon. And, and, and what happens is uh, in a manufacturing sense, they use, a, the, they use this uh, you know, a, a gas law from physics um, to cool air down to a temperature between the boiling points of oxygen and nitrogen. And uh, you do that by dropping the pressure really quickly before the volume expands. So the pressure drops more than the volume increases and the temperature must go down. So if you remember this equation, or I put it here in case you don't remember it from perhaps a long time ago. And, uh, and so then the nitrogen gas floats away and the oxygen is liquefied and stays. And then they do it again to get rid of the argon. And so here's a picture of a dis fractional distillation facility. This is, I think, in Leipzig. And then once the liquid oxygen is made, it's transported to uh, the site where it's used. For example, St. Paul's Hospital. And, uh, and, and this is a picture of actually a hospital in Cincinnati. And these are two, they're two large oxygen tanks. They each hold 33 million liters of oxygen. And the hospital, this university hospital, sort of a quaternary center, uses about a million liters of oxygen per day. And there's a backup tank here that provides two or three days worth. And there is, you know, it's not perfectly, like some of the oxygen is lost along the way. So this ends up being about three weeks supply here. You can see there's also these pipes. And these pipes are what the, where the liquid oxygen turns back into gas. It warms up and turns back into gas. And during COVID, there were pictures of oxygen facilities where these pipes had iced over because there was such a, such a demand for oxygen. There was so much cold oxygen going through that ice was forming. And then they were, they were losing pressure in the system because they couldn't warm up the gas and get it into the system. And of course, you also heard during COVID, I'm sure, of shortages in places like India or other, other parts of the world where the infrastructure is just not the same. And, and actually liquid oxygen is not the primary way by which oxygen is given to patients in acute care. And instead it's either by portable oxygen tanks or sometimes another method called pressure swing adsorption. Um, as a last comment on that note, you know, this is despite the fact that the WHO has listed oxygen as one of its essential medicines. So one of the medicines that should always be available in acute care facilities. Okay, and now, um, so we've, we've, we've gone over a little bit of the history, we've got a little bit of how oxygen is made and gets to that, you know, magical flow meter on the wall. But, you know, what do we do with it? You know, do we target, um, for example, the saturation or the partial pressure of arterial oxygen? Uh, maybe if you're like a fancy neurointensivist, you might target like tissue oxygenation in the brain, but we're not going to talk about that. We're going to focus on the practical targets like saturation or partial pressure. And this is the uh, arterial content of oxygen equation, maybe familiar to some, maybe not everyone. So I'll walk you through it briefly. Uh, here we have 1.39 times hemoglobin. So this, this, this comes from the fact that uh, each gram of hemoglobin can hold approximately 1.39 milliliters of oxygen. It's a little bit less if you have some hemoglobin is methemoglobin or something else, but you know, it's close enough. And this is, you multiply this by the saturation, so the proportion of hemoglobin that's holding some oxygen. And then you add over here the, the contribution from dissolved oxygen in the, in, the, in the arterial blood. And if you sub in some numbers, like 97% saturation, a PaO2 of 100, you can see that the dissolved, in blood, most of the oxygen is actually bound to hemoglobin. You know, maybe only two or 3% is dissolved. So that's why, for the most part, we target the saturation. But of course, there's a caveat because cells don't see the, the, the oxygen divide, uh, uh, um, bound to hemoglobin. They see the dissolved oxygen. So it has to diffuse into the cells and to diffuse into the mitochondria. So in reality, you know, we should think about both. But usually by the time the PaO2 is low enough that it's causing problems, the saturation has also dropped to a dramatic extent. And so if we're going to target the saturation, what saturation to target? Uh, this is a very famous figure, I'm sure many people have seen it many times, the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, like this elegant sigmoid shape. And there's sort of the steep part here that we try and stay away from. 
And that's part of why an 88% or higher is generally, uh, you know, uh, the, the sort of saturations people target or, or debate between. And, uh, and, and as you get below that, you see a small change in the dissolved oxygen will cause a large change in the saturation and, uh, and overall oxygen delivery to tissues. Um, there are actually several trials in critical care medicine comparing different oxygen strategies like, uh, you know, a higher, uh, higher targets, lower targets, sort of in the middle. There's some observational evidence suggesting a U-shaped curve where like, you know, sort of in the middle might be the best. Um, but I, I've put up here the results of what I would say is my favorite trial on this topic. It's 2,500 patients from Vanderbilt. And what I like about it is that they excluded almost nobody, only like, you know, a single digit percentages as opposed to like 50% or 70% that some trials exclude. And they, they, had really, they followed the saturations really closely. So they, they, they very carefully kept patients to either 90, 94, or 98%, sort of plus or minus 2% for each of these. And fortunately, they showed basically no clinical difference between any of these targets. So for me, I, I usually recommend going with the middle one because we may not monitor patients quite as closely as they did in this trial. So maybe you want to make sure, you know, if you, if you aim for the middle, you'll stay away from the extremes. For sure, at the extremes, there is harm. But within the boundaries of, you know, these sort of saturation targets, it doesn't seem to be a big difference. All right, now we're going to, we'll, we'll switch back to our sort of historical development and uh, talk a little bit more about oxygen devices. So the first oxygen devices, there were some tubes that people would like, like rubber hoses people would breathe out of. But then... Um, you know, nasal prongs really became the predominant device around the start of the 20th century. Um, and they really looked a lot like they do today. This is a more modern one, but really it doesn't look very different in illustrations from the early 20th century. Nasal prongs, of course, have, uh, you know, they're easy to use and they're comfortable, but their drawbacks are that you can't go much higher than six liters per minute in terms of flow. And the inspired oxygen that you, fraction that you get from it varies according to your minute ventilation. So in efforts to try and in increase the inspired oxygen fraction, scientists you know, tried different things. The problem is when you clo enclose sort of the mouth and nose to ensure that you're only getting oxygen, then you run into problems with rebreathing. So fortunately, J.S. Haldane proposed something which looks a lot like our modern non-rebreather mask here. You've got oxygen flowing in, you have a reservoir bag, there was a valve between the reservoir bag and the patient, and then another valve on the mask that allowed air to escape. And, uh, that's, and, and that's sort of how even our modern non-rebreathers work. Now, nowadays, usually these masks are not full non-rebreathers, like the valves are not, you know, there's not usually valves on both sides here. Um, but you still get patients inhaling some of the air from the, from the bag, some air from the room, and then exhaling without uh, causing carbon dioxide sort of retention or too much rebreathing. Uh, so the inspired oxygen fraction of a non-rebreather mask, however, is not 100%. So there was a, a trial of different non-invasive oxygen supports done in about 2015. And as part of that trial, you know, they had randomized some people to non-rebreather masks. And, uh, and they measured the oxygen saturation in the mouth, like, like just at the edge of the mask, right before it goes into the, uh, um, into the mouth. And uh, they found that you know, the best formula for predicting an inspired oxygen fraction from a flow is actually the 21% plus three times the flow in liters per minute. So I think the 4% formula was sort of more popular for a long time, but it turns out that overestimates by about 10% on average, the inspired oxygen fraction. And the other big takeaway from this is that 15 liters a minute non-rebreather, that's actually 65%. That's not 100%. Of course, it's not constant for all patients. And, and in this study, they were able to sort of demonstrate some principles that you might have guessed that, for example, a higher respiratory rate, a taller patient, or a lower PaCO2 were all associated with a lower measured inspired oxygen fraction. The next innovation was Venturi masks. And this happened around 1960. And we're getting a little out of order because invasive ventilation sort of became popular just before that. And non-invasive ventilation was invented even a little bit before that. But um, we're sort of compromising between a uh, escalating intensity and uh, you know, historical order. So in the, in the 1960s, Venturi masks were invented. And they were sort of, they're, called, they're named this way because they, in theory, rely on the Venturi principle. So you have a pipe with a fluid flowing through, and when the and, and the flow is constant through the pipe, so the same amount of volume per unit time. Uh, 
And so when it goes through a narrowing, you get an increase in the velocity so that the same volume per unit time can, can make it through. And we were all familiar with this with rivers and, 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 and you, you've maybe heard about this before in terms of venturi masks. So you have oxygen going really quickly through and narrowing. And then that causes a decrease in pressure relative to room air and entrainment of room air. And so if you, if you set the opening sizes and the flows just right, then you can achieve a flow of gas that has a, pre, that has a, a known inspired, a known fraction of oxygen. And there's different colors used to denote the different settings. And they say right on it what flow to set it at to get that inspired oxygen fraction. Um, now, invasive ventilation in, 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 in the 1950s uh, became the sort of mainstay of treatment for respiratory, severe respiratory failure. And that, and that happened during the uh, pandemic, or during an epidemic of polio in Copenhagen. I've included here, this is a book which maybe you're familiar with, maybe not. And um, this, is, this is written by my colleague and, and, and friend and collaborator, Hannah Wunsch. She is a scientist, a clinician scientist, pr previously based out of Sunnybrook and now based out of Columbia in New York. And she wrote this book um, uh, all about uh, the polio epidemic and how that sort of kicked off the modern discipline of critical care medicine. And what happened was there were many, many children, hundreds of children were falling ill with a, a, a strain of polio that was particularly nasty. It was causing a lot of neuromuscular respiratory failure. Children were becoming hypercapnic and drowning in their own secretions. And Ibsen was an anesthesiologist who had done some training in the US and he had worked a lot in the operating rooms, but and he, he proposed that maybe we should do a tracheotomy and try manually ventilating these patients. And so they did that with the first patient. Her name was Vivi Ebert. She was 11, I think. And they saved her life. And they realized, oh, this is a good idea. So they did this for all of the patients who were running into respiratory failure. But they didn't have ventilators. So they enlisted medical students uh, um, uh, from Copenhagen to come and manually ventilate the patients. And over the next 15 years, um, you know, different types of respiratory failure that were sort of previously unknown because patients would die without invasive ventilation were sort of were, began to be discovered, including ARDS, the Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome, discovered in 19, well, described in 1967 by Ashbaugh and colleagues. Now, these chest x-ray rooms are really crappy, but you can still see there's sort of bilateral infiltrates. There's a few different causes listed. There's a trauma case as well, which I've cut off. It's, you know, because it didn't fit on the slide very nicely, but it has all the sort of elements of ARDS with which we're familiar with to this day. And now one, one issue that was sort of not clear then and remains a little bit actually unclear to this date is when to actually institute invasive ventilation. There are no guidelines, there's actually very little data. This is a, one of the primary areas that I'm researching nowadays. And uh, you know, what we're trying to prevent is cardiopulmonary collapse or maybe the hypothesized entity of patient self-inflicted lung injury, the idea that breaths that are too large and too high of pressures can actually make things worse. And on the other hand, we, you know, but we don't want to subject patients unnecessarily to the risks of peri-intubation shock and cardiac arrest, ventilator-induced lung injury, infectious uh, ventilator-associated infections, immobility, or the delirium and post-traumatic stress disorder that we see associated with the whole package of care that comes along with invasive ventilation. And so, you know, clinicians were really starting to notice that mm, it would be nice if we could provide the benefits of invasive ventilation without some of those harms. And that's why non-invasive ventilation became more, more widely used. It was invented in the 1940s and used on like a series of patients that was uh, mixed, you know, many different kinds of respiratory failure. But it fell out of favor because of the, uh, you know, the takeoff of invasive ventilation in the, in the 50s and 60s, 70s. And it was sort of in the mid 80s because it had been, the technology had developed for sort of chronic home use and then began to be applied again in acute care that it became a, a sort of an option. And it was sort of in 1995 that Laurent Brochard, the current chair of my department, published this landmark trial that shows non-invasive ventilation uh, improves mortality for COPD patients versus just non-rebreather masks. And, and, and the classic interfaces are a face mask, and there's also a full face mask that sort of goes around here. And then if you're Italian or if you're uh, or Italy adjacent, then there's a, a helmets have also become popular. Uh, you know, we do use these sometimes in Toronto, but I, patients get very claustrophobic and sort of, there's a trial ongoing to look at helmet versus high flow nasal cannula to see if, uh, you know, that might be, uh, that might be better. Um, high flow nasal cannula is sort of the last 
and most recent oxygen device that we commonly use. And uh, uh, it features a, a, an oxygen and air blender where you set, uh, a, a, you set an inspired oxygen fraction and a flow. And the flow is usually 30 or even 60 liters per minute. So it's basically a flow that can exceed the peak inspiratory flow of the patient so that you really can deliver a, a set inspired oxygen fraction. And then it's heated and humidified. It's hu heated so that the, ox the water content is higher. You can get it more humid. And then it's delivered in a tube, which is actually partially heated to the nose. And there's several uh, mechanisms, physiologic mechanisms by which this might be helpful. First, the humidification might help with secretions. Upper airway washout could potentially help uh, it reduce the dead space. So instead of your dead space beginning at your mouth, maybe it begins back or somewhere in your oropharynx because of washout. Uh, the, the high nasal flow alleviates the sensation of dyspnea. The positive air, slight positive airway pressure, a peep of probably three to three or four centimeters can help with VQ matching and decreased entrainment of ambient air helps make sure you know, you've got the FiO2 you set uh, being delivered to the patient. You know, contemporary trials have compared these approaches. Um, there are many trials. I'm gonna show you a few of my favorite, uh, two of my favorite by, uh, by Frat, a French, uh, French intensivist. So in 2015, he published a trial where they compared non-rebreather masks to non-invasive ventilation to high-flow nasal cannula. And the red line here, this is intubation, incidence of intubation. So more intubation is up here, less is down here. And you see the red line is high-flow nasal cannula. It's well below the other two lines. And there was, and now and he also looked at survival. And survival is so better is high up here, and then you know more death is down here. And you can see the red line again is above the other two lines. For COVID, it was similar with respect to intubation. So they, the, you know, again, the yellow line is a bit lower here for high flow nasal, high flow nasal oxygen, a little less intubation. But for mortality, it was actually the same for COVID. And there's other research in COVID that showed no difference between high flow and standard oxygen. Although, you know, we can get into the nuances of that, but I think the practice patterns in England were very different than in Canada um, um, during that time. And there's a network meta-analysis done by one of my colleagues and friends, Bruno Ferrero in Toronto. And he, he, this came out right at the start of the pandemic, and it sort of corroborated these things that, you know, there's probably a, a reduction in intubation with using high-flow nasal oxygen or non-invasive ventilation relative to just a non-rebreather mask. Um, but the signal with mortality might be a little less convincing. All right, so we've covered, out, we've outlined some of the history of oxygen therapy. We've discussed the physiologic rationale and evidence for a few different oxygen devices. And now we're going to focus a little more on some contemporary inequities in the use of oxygen therapy according to patient race. And we'll just begin by um, saying, and, and you may all be very familiar with this, but just to say it, that you know, race is actually, it's a social construct, not a biological one. And there is a tendency sometimes to think that if we're you know, studying race as a variable um, that might explain differences in care, that we're studying something biological about the race, but that is not at all the case. And that's something that people uh, sometimes um, you know, get muddled up on um, with respect to pulse oximetry, which is where we're gonna go first. And I'll explain more in a moment. Um, so the first inequity we're gonna talk about is that occult hypoxemia is more common in people with darker skin pigment. And uh, occult, occult hypoxemia, you might ask, what is that? Well. So that's when you've got a peripheral oxygen saturation of 92% or more, but the actual saturation measured on an arterial blood gas is less than 88. And this is obviously not an ideal situation. And it's actually been known ever since the start of pulse oximeters that pulse oximeter, that, that this happened more frequently in patients with darker skin pigment. Um, but the FDA sort of approved the technology anyways. Um, and, you know, it's been known since 1990 was when uh, Martin Tobin and another scientist published about this. But it really came back to um, the forefront of our, of our sort of awareness in, that, in 2020 when Michael Schoding and others at the University of Michigan published this study where um, they, they showed this discrepancy was really quite common and important. And, and on, in this figure here, we've got on the x-axis the peripheral oxygen sat. So this is the saturation measured on the pulse oximeter on the finger or wherever else. And then on the y-axis, you have the arterial oxygen saturation. So you can see at every peripheral oxygen sat, black patients had lower arterial saturations than white patients. And at lower peripheral sats, the, 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 this discrepancy actually becomes quite important because some of, these, uh, some of these measured arterial sats are actually getting quite low 
and you know, concerningly low, where we would probably want to apply more oxygen and fix this if we knew about it. And it's true that occult hypoxemia seems to have consequences. This is a cohort from John Hopkins, um, where uh, they looked at the time from a predicted arterial saturation of 94% or of less than 94% to the initiation of oxygen. So on the y-axis is the initiation, the proportion who had oxygen initiated. Um, and the x-axis is the time from that saturation of less than 94. And you can see that black and Hispanic non-black patients are clearly having less oxygen and later than white patients. For Asian patients, which were very few in this cohort, it's a little less clear. Mortality is also impacted. Occult hypoxemia across, many, uh, across all races is associated with increased mortality. But because it is more common in uh, 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 Black or Hispanic and also Asian patients in the US, all three of those uh, race and ethnic groups have been shown to have increased uh, prevalence of occult hypoxemia, obviously it impacts in a differential way. So how do we address this? Like, what do we do about this? I can tell you that at the University of Michigan, where there, you know, many of the studies on this have been done, what they have a sort of uh, a very, a very clear algorithm where their respiratory therapists will flag in the chart when the arterial blood gas and a concurrently recorded peripheral sat are discordant. And they're very attentive to this. And if they, know, if they notice, if this is flagged for a patient, they might you know, use, use arterial blood gases more often. Now that's what they do in the critical care unit. And what do I do? I sort of do that on an ad hoc basis, but we don't have any sort of organized program like this at, in, at Toronto General or Scarborough General where I work. And there is actually some hope from the tech, on the technological front where researchers are looking into a green light based pulse oximeter that might be more accurate across different uh, degrees of skin pigmentation. And so I'll just go back one moment to what I had said about race being a social construct. So the explanation here, just to elaborate on it, is that you know, the reason why this is an issue of race and not biology is that um, you know, despite the, uh, you know, the problem itself might be based in skin pigment, but it was the regulations in place and the FDA's decision to allow the technology to become widely used despite documentation of this dis discrepancy according to, um, you know, which is strongly correlated with race. And so this is, this is how, um, you know, uh, systemic racism sort of can work, one of the ways in which it can, can, can worsen outcomes, right? Because the regulation and the governing bodies are not attending to issues that correlate with race. The second issue I'll just mention briefly is uh, uh, um, about bias in the use of invasive ventilation. And this is a project I had the good fortune to supervise with Fred Abdel Malik. He's a medical student at the University of Toronto. And you know, we asked the question about whether um, you know, the use of invasive ventilation might differ according to patient race and ethnicity. And we looked at both race and ethnicity sort of lumped together because that's the data we had available. But of course, they are distinct entities. Um, but our theory was that you know, there are no clear, there are no agreed upon criteria for the use of invasive ventilation. And whenever you have a decision that is more subjective, it's vulnerable to implicit bias. And so for our design, we, we, we studied uh, two large cohorts of ICU patients, about 40,000 patients in total. And these databases had very detailed measurements of FiO2, oxygen device, heart rate, respiratory rate, many, you know, confounders of the potential relationship between the exposure and the outcome. And we looked at it in a, all of these confounders in a time varying nature. And so you can imagine that basically we were getting at the, the question of you have two patients in front of you, they are identical in terms of age, sex, um, inspired oxygen fraction, oxygen, oxygen device, respiratory rate, you know, many, many different factors. The only difference is their charted race and ethnicity. And is there a difference in the rate of invasive ventilation? And we found that there was. So again, 40,000 patients, the majority were white, um, and we saw a decreased rate of invasive ventilation in patients of Asian black, in Asian black and Hispanic patients relative to white patients. We found this quite surprising um, because, you know, research on goals of care in the United States has shown that uh, black patients or Asian patients are usually um, you know, usually it's less common that there's a limitation on the goals of care, for example. And, you know, that research I showed you about occult hypoxemia would, would bias things in the other direction. 
because we, you know, we adjusted for the peripheral saturation. So you could imagine that the two patients in front of you had the same peripheral oxygen saturation. So that means that the black patient might have had a lower arterial saturation and been a little bit sicker and more likely to get in, in, intubated. And so this is really, you know, in the opposite direction from what we expected. I'd say it was probably in the direction that we feared. And, you know, it could be that there's other unmeasured confounders that explain it, but many of the other unmeasured confounders that you propose, you sort of have to ask yourself, well, are they confounders or are they mediators? And I mean, what I mean by that, I'll explain with an example. Like, for example, socioeconomic status. In the United States of America, it's well known that uh, socioeconomic status and race are correlated, right? But is that really, like, is that, are those really two independent, like, unrelated things? Or is, or, 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 or is, or is it in some sense that socioeconomic status may be mediating some of the health disparities that we see, right? Um, we talked about the pulse oximetry possible explanation. Um, now, it, it is the case that um, other research on disparities by a patient race in the United States has shown that some of it can be explained by clustering at the hospital level. That is that the proportion of patients of different races or ethnicities varies from hospital to hospital, as does those hospitals' care practices. And we did sensitivity analyses to look at that. We did see that that was the case for part of it, but it didn't explain all of the, it did not explain all of the disparity that we saw. And so we were left with sort of the very uncomfortable finding that maybe part of this is related to either overt racism or implicit bias. So we'll return to our case. So we've got our 60-year-old uh, 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 patient with pneumonia, and how are we going to support their hypoxemic respiratory failure? So for me, I think high-flow nasal cannula is practical. Evidence suggests that it's prob it probably have a benefit with respect to intubation and maybe even with respect to mortality. Um, I would ask myself, is there a role here for an arterial blood gas to check for occult hypoxemia? Because I think we'd all feel a little differently if that saturation was 85 instead of 94, especially if it stayed at 94 after putting someone on high-flow nasal cannula and escalating the respiratory support. And last of all, I would just, you know, we can ask ourselves, is, could, 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 could the patient's race or other, other factors that are known to, you know, uh, are, known to be sub are known to cause implicit bias be influencing our decision-making in this, in this case? And so that's, uh, um, that's more or less where I'll leave off and I'll open up to some questions. But you know, we discussed a little, bit about, a little bit of history, a little bit of physiology and trials, and a little bit about contemporary uh, evidence on inequities. So thanks very much for listening. And um, you know, I've tried to leave a little time for questions if that's uh, uh, interesting to anybody in the audience. But, um, and thanks again for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Yarnell, and uh, I'll open it up to questions from the audience on at St. Paul's or on Zoom. You can just unmute. No questions here, it seems. <laughs> can I, I'd like to ask a, a question around um, uh, the most recent paper that you described. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I'm wondering about, um, you know, when you present these kinds of findings, when you have all this unexplained variance that, that your variables don't, so you're left with wondering, is it related to practitioner? Because it's really yeah. more around the health system. And when you present it, particularly to your colleagues that are in critical care, can you share with us, like, how is that received? What are the comments? What are the reasons people explain what you observed in, in the data? Thank you. Oh, thanks, Dr. Powell. It's a great question. You know, so we we you know we've had we have had the chance to present these results at the um, at the Canadian Critical Care Forum last November. So so Fred Fred, you know, was able to present it as a as a poster and and, and I also got the chance to, to talk about it in a little bit of a larger forum. And I think that um, you know, mo 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 unfortunately, it's quite plausible to most people that the decision to, for, it to, for intubation could be influenced by something like this. I think, you know, mo most intensivists actually acknowledge that this decision is mostly based on uh, a sort of, you know, intuitive integration of many different variables. And, you know, people actually find it quite plausible that that could be influenced by bias in ways that are, um, 
you know, that we, that we don't desire. And, you know, some, some people, I would say, share, you know, um, think a little bit similarly to me that it's sort of motivation to try and make progress on coming up with some, you know, actual criteria to guide that decision with a little more uh, objectivity. Although, of course, that probably wouldn't fix the issue entirely, but maybe it might help a little bit. And, um, you know, that's been sort of the, you know, the, the in-person reaction to that is mostly along those lines. And now I'll say that reviewers for the paper were sort of a little, you know, a, 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 seemed a little less open to that potential explanation. And, um, uh, uh, and, and you know, there's, I, I think there's differences in interpreting the part of it that relates to hospital level variation. So, you know, you could see that as, well, you know, there's just some hospitals do things in different ways. But you might also see that as, you know, some hospitals are systematically underfunded and, uh, you know, uh, and some hospitals are not. And, you know, I, I admit I'm a little worried about the latter one, um, you know, because what, what, what we found is that overall the, the use of invasive ventilation was like generally less overall in the hospitals that had a higher proportion of, of, uh, or, uh, of, of Asian, Black and Hispanic patients. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure if that sort of answers your question a little bit. Um, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just have a question in regards to the cult hypoxemia. Yes. Uh, when you take a blood gas and you see a difference between the gas saturation and the pulse oximeter, uh, do you find that it's typically a constant difference and then you use that as a baseline or is it unrelated? Oh, yeah. You know, that's a great question. And um, you know, I, I guess, I think, I think it's not totally clear, you know, and, uh, and it's not, it's not addressed in any of those papers that I showed you. They don't, uh, they, 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 they haven't, you know, addressed that directly. Um, what I tend to do is I tend to, I tend to, you know, if, if, if you check and you don't see it, then I sort of feel a little bit better, but if I check and I see it, then it makes me want to check more often, you know, cause I, I, I I, I do wonder if it can come and go depending on perfusion or, you know, maybe where the saturation probe is, is placed. But that, I think that's a very insightful question. And, um, uh, and uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get your name, but thank you very much for asking it. Yeah. Thank you. I guess questions? I'll just say as well that the, you know, like arterial blood gases are a huge pain, right? Like they're literally painful. And logistically, they're hard to organize, and especially patients outside the ICU. So, you know, like, you can't be doing, like, multi, like daily or, like, multiple times, like, EBGs in patients who are, like, on the ward. It's just not, that's not feasible. So I guess, you know, from a practical point of view, I guess I sort of perceive it as probably, you know, probably that's, that's what the disparity is for that given patient. But, you know, if, you're, if it really matters that you, that you know it, then I recheck. But that's sort of just a, a small addendum to my answer that I you know, realized that I thought a bit more about it, yeah. Any other questions? Well, hearing none, uh, just want to thank you so much, Dr. Yarnell, for coming and presenting to our medical grand round. We really appreciate it. It was very enlightening um, presentation, particularly the history and the shocking origin of uh, ventilation <laughs> originating in poor children in Copenhagen with, uh, it sounds like a fascinating book. Uh, so thank you for sharing all of that with us. I think we all learned a lot um, and wishing you uh, very best in the rest of your time in BC and safe thank travels. You. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, I'll tell you that Hannah Wunsch has not paid me to promote her book. Don't okay. Worry about that. <laughs> we'll I, just, I genuinely enjoyed it, yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.